This is a story of our church, our community, our message, and you. First, the story of our church. Mission started in a living room over 20 years ago with a vision of reaching and serving the East Valley, especially those who had not yet heard or embraced the message of Jesus. Like most great stories, our story involves both thrilling adventure as well as unexpected tragedy. However, God has always been at the center of this story, changing lives both in the years we were thriving and proving his faithfulness in the years we were just surviving. All of this has shaped who we are and has led us to the edge of the next chapter in our story. And we believe this new chapter is strategically connected to the story of our community. Some of you can remember driving through the East Valley when it was more vastly inhabited by cattle than by people. Miles spanned between shopping centers and gas stations, and there were only a few dining options in a very quiet, simple downtown Gilbert. All of this began to change, though, as our humble town began to grow and thrive with explosive residential and economic development, innovation and education, as well as healthy civic progress, all in a uniquely family-centric environment. Our community was on the rise. Our community began to be recognized and awarded in various ways and by various groups as one of the country's best and most thriving places to live. However, while this story is familiar to most of us, the untold story of our community remains largely unknown, hidden, and out of sight. The truth is, the rate of divorce in our community is also on the rise. Prescription drug abuse is on the rise. Financial debt, emotional stress, teenage suicide, all on the rise. And a brand new issue in the landscape of our society, depression amongst not just our teenagers, but our children is also on the rise. Many of our family, friends, and neighbors are struggling relationally. Their families are hurting internally. Many are facing depression, addiction, and despair, alone and in private. While as a community we are thriving on the outside, many are barely just surviving on the inside. These challenges present us with a massive opportunity though, an opportunity intimately connected to our message, the message of Jesus, the gospel message, that has the potential to radically transform the hidden story of our community. It provides life to those who are dying, light in the midst of darkness, hope in the face of despair. We believe the missing piece to a community that is truly thriving is the transformational life, love, and message of Jesus. And that's where you come in. This opportunity in front of us in this next chapter requires every single one of you, every single one of us, joining together to be for everyone. We believe this is what will make us unique. In a world full of institutions, organizations, even churches, primarily known for what they're against, we will work hard to be known for who we are for. For everyone who doesn't think church would or could be for them. For everyone who thinks they've messed up too bad or strayed too far. For everyone who served another God or lived as if there was no God for far too long. For everyone struggling in secret, paralyzed by fear, searching for greater meaning, purpose, and value, we will be for them. But it will require every single one of us working together on mission to show them that Jesus is for them, and so are we. We were never meant to simply attend the church. We were instructed to be the church. This new chapter is an invitation to rise up and be the church that will fearlessly and unapologetically be for everyone. Our plan is quite simple. We will work hard to foster irresistible community where people can belong regardless of what they believe or how they behave. A radically inclusive community of people who like Jesus accept everyone just as they are but loves them way too much to allow them to stay that way. Second, we'll create irresistible environments where our next door neighbor and the next generation want to be. Environments that are both attractional and transformational. Finally, we'll forge opportunities for irresistible impact where those around us who need help the most can receive it. Opportunities to reach out, to add value to those in our community who aren't yet ready to take steps towards us, let alone Jesus. We believe this next chapter is the story of arising. The story of arising of a community of faith to once again shine a bright light into dark places. The rising of the gospel message that brings healing, hope, and help for everyone who believes. The rising of the next generation equipped with a strong foundation to carry the torch of our faith well beyond us into the future. All of this centered around the rising of the story of a risen Savior who gave his life out of love for everyone. This new chapter begins now, and this new chapter begins 
with you. Well, good morning. Welcome to Mission. My name is Kevin. It's so good to see all of you. Well, hey, if you're a regular attender around here, you've seen that video a few different times. And doesn't it get you fired up, the massive opportunity that we have here in our community? Are you with us? Let's go. Come on. Let's go a little clap here. Let's get excited about that. That's good. These guys are really excited here. Hey, if you're brand new here, you showed up in the middle of a series that we are calling Thrive, where we're taking a close look at what it means to fully thrive in our faith with Jesus and helping others fully thrive in their faith as well. Well, hey, you are in for a treat because today's a special day. As we continue our Thrive series, today you're going to have a chance to hear from and see the plans of what that video just alluded to. It's a short-term vision impacting fully on the long-term scale to be successful in our mission in leading this community to find thriving life in Jesus. So we'll say we are super excited. I like that. We've got a woo down here. This is good. We're going to have a fun time today. But if you're brand new today, here's what I want you to know, that you want, we are just, we are a church that is for you. We are so thrilled that you're here today, regardless of your background, regardless of your belief system, regardless of what you did last week, and even what you did last night. We believe that God has a purpose and a plan for you, and we believe that God has something for you here today. So welcome. We are super excited that you're here with us. We would just love to invite you over to the hub. Ask a guest service member. They're in the gray shirts right there. They can point you in the right direction. Again, we'd just love to welcome you and give you a free gift for stopping by. Well, let's go ahead and stand up. We're going to have a great service today, and say hello to the person around you, and we'll get started here in just a second.
Now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. Our creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God.
It is so good to, to sing with you. Thank you so much for joining us and singing out with us this morning. At uh, this time, you can go ahead and take a seat, and I would love to invite forward our volunteers as we give of our tithes and offerings.
Well, today is a special day as we're continuing our Thrive series. Uh, before we jump into that, I gotta just tell you something. This isn't part of the script, um, and I, I probably won't do this at all services, but it just struck me a, a moment ago um, how um, God uses so many different people's gifts in so many different ways. And um, literally over the last couple of weeks, uh, I was sitting there thinking the number of people who've been out, um, many of you know people who've been sick, the number of volunteers we've had out, and people step up um, into roles and, and serve in so many different ways and next gen and, 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 and here in the services, it's just extraordinary. And um, um, one of the things you don't know is, is sometimes that affects uh, what's happening up here. And we do a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. And um, one of the things you would have never known um, is that just two hours before the service, we had somebody who showed up and they weren't able to, to help lead us this morning. And so Yvonne, who led us this morning, with less than two hours of notice, got ready to lead us in worship this morning. Was that not amazing? This made me emotional and just how powerful it was um, as she led us through some really amazing truths. And the one that struck me that I want to start with today that so um, goes to the heart of our series is that when the lies speak louder than the truth, we need reminders. We need reminders of who we belong to. We need to be reminded of what our value is. When, when there's a darkness in our lives that we can't see past, we need to be reminded that there's a God who's in control, who's a God who's, who's sovereign over everything, who's walking right by our side. And if you're here today and you're in one of those situations, um, I want you to know our hope is that this morning you are reminded that there's a heavenly father who sees you and he sees you right where you are and he cares about you and he wants to walk with you and so do we. Uh, we've been in this series called Thrive and we've been talking about these sort of things and it goes to the heart of our mission. Our mission is to lead people to thriving life in Jesus. And that's all of our efforts are around leading people to thriving life in Jesus. And um, at the first part of this series, we talked about the fact that the reason that is is because that's what Jesus came for. His stated purpose was to come to lead us to abundant life in him. And um, there's, a, there's a life, a fullness of life, a full measure of life in God that you can experience. The, the most prolific writer about this was the Apostle Paul. And the book of Ephesians is all about how we experience this fullness of the full measure of God's blessing and, and God's life in our lives, in this life and the life to come. And so we started the very first week. We jumped into Ephesians. We, we sort of covered the first three chapters of Ephesians, but we camped out in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter three, it talks about, Paul prayed a prayer for us. It's so different than our culture, that we would be rooted and established in something that doesn't seem tangible. It doesn't seem like something we can buy or something we can attach ourselves to, but that we'd be rooted and established in something that would change the trajectory of our lives and it would change the output of our lives. And one of the things we said the first week is that the fruit of our lives actually comes from the roots of our lives. And there's a whole bunch of messages out there that are trying to get us to root our lives in a bunch of other things. But this is what the Apostle Paul prayed for you and for me. He prayed uh, that we would be rooted and established in love, in the love of God, and that that would empower us. That would give us the power to ward off all those other messages that tell us that they can give us value. They can provide us the happiness that we want in life so that we could be filled, excuse me, to all the fullness, the, the measure of the fullness of God, that we could experience the fullness of the life that God has for each one of us. We acknowledge that there's, there's a, a huge effort. There's $200 billion worth of messages spent every year uh, begging, if not coercing us, to find our life rooted in all sorts of other things. And um, uh, we, we spent some time last week in Ephesians chapter four, and we talked about the fact that this very thing, that there's a gap. Those messages create a gap oftentimes for us between what we think is true and what's actually true. There's a gap between what we think is true about life and what's actually true, what we think will make us happy and what will actually make us happy, what we think the problems are in our relational dynamics in our marriage or in our offices or in our careers and what's actually true. And it's hard sometimes to discover the, the difference, but the gap between what's uh, what we think is true, what's actually true is actually the distance between our potential to grow and actually thrive in our relationship with God and in life. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter four, if you weren't here, talked about the fact how this takes all of us. It doesn't just take one person standing on a stage. It doesn't take a few leaders in a church. It takes all of us, that you've all been gifted, you've all been called, and the body isn't the body unless every part is a part of the body. And so we talked about last week what it looks like for us all to engage and center our lives around taking steps to grow and thrive in our faith. This is literally centering our lives on truth is how we grow and we thrive. Now, today we're gonna press pause on Ephesians. And if you, you like Ephesians and you're ready to jump into chapter five, we're gonna pick that up next week. Uh, Ephesians chapter five, um, I'm gonna warn you today, um, today is not gonna feel a lot like a sermon. Um, and the reason is, is because today we're gonna respond a little bit to what we talked about the first two weeks. 
We talked about uh, what, it, what it is for us to be rooted and established in something that can help us thrive in life, what it looks like um, uh, for a whole community of people. The, the, the reason it's necessary for a whole community of people to use their gifts to help not just individuals, but us as a community and our broader community that we think God's placed us in the middle of to grow and thrive. But today, what I wanna do for our next few minutes is, uh, and I'm gonna get some help, I wanna share with you some plans and dreams that we have for making some quantum steps in that direction in the next couple of years. As a matter of fact, uh, about a year ago, uh, we started uh, dreaming and planning. And um, we started specifically with our vision statement. And if you don't know what our vision statement, our vision is this. Our vision uh, is to be an irresistible church for our next door neighbor and the next generation. And uh, if you know, mission is what we do. This, we don't really get a, get a choice in that. And we were told in the scriptures, in Matthew 28, John 10, 10, the great commission, the great commandment tells the church what it's to be about. And we're to lead people to life, to new life uh, in Jesus. And, and we, we say that around here that's leading people a thriving life in Jesus. That's what we do. Where we're headed as a church is we wanna be an irresistible church for our next door neighbors and the next generation. We believe God's placed us here to have a significant impact in the valley. And what we do is for everyone. It's, it's for you. It's for your next door neighbors. It's for the next generation. It's for the East Valley. But that drove us to ask a question. Is what's, what obstacles are keeping us, the message of Jesus specifically, the transformational message of Jesus from um, from being irresistible, or a better way to say that is what obstacles exist that make it resistible. And last year, uh, about this time, actually in the middle of February last year, we began a series of leadership offsites with our board and our staff. And we began asking this question and it, and it trickled out into our staff and into some of our key volunteer teams, into our broader volunteers. And, and many of you have given some input into this, but we, we really were centered around this idea that we wanna, we wanna discover what obstacles, and another way to say this, what obstacles specifically are in the way for us leading people to thriving life in Jesus. We wanna be an irresistible church for our next door neighbor and the next generation, but to lead them to thriving life in Jesus. And again, this is not just about them, it's about you, it's about us. And so as we, we began doing some, some studying, as we've been uh, unearthing, you know, what is it that would keep people from taking steps in that direction to thriving in their faith, um, we spent a lot of time uh, in, the, in the sort of defining the problem stage, and then we began to put together a plan a short-term plan over the next couple of years to build something, to build a system, to build a series of environments, to, to create uh, here uh, something that would align with our vision, that would actually ensure that people could take steps towards that. And so that, that resulted in what we call our 2020 Vision Initiative. And uh, over the next two years, we've, we've set some pretty high uh, uh, goals for what we wanna accomplish over the next few years. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about that because it specifically relates to you. And there's some things that we're gonna need your help in uh, in a lot of different ways. It's some things that, it's good, that are gonna benefit you in an extraordinary way. It's some things that are gonna benefit, that are targeted towards your neighbor, towards your kids, towards your grandkids. And I want you to understand it because we're at a place where we actually need to invite you and help you, uh, invite you into, based on what we talked about last week, where we need the whole body in order for us to be successful. So I wanna take the first one of these. The first one is irresistible community. What are we gonna do to create irresistible community? Here's what we believe. Community becomes irresistible when the group of people that are in that community are thriving. When you think about it, when you think about a group of friends, when you think about people you know, when it seems like they're experiencing something better, when it seems like they've, they've, uh, they've, they've experienced something either in their relationships or in their community that's better, we're drawn to that. As a matter of fact, externally, and we talked about this a lot in the first week, that's why a lot of people are drawn to this community and why this community continues to grow and all the projections are that it will continue to grow. It's because people are drawn towards things that are thriving. We also talked about, though, that, that just below the surface, there's a lot of people in our community that seem like they're thriving externally, but are barely surviving on the inside. And the truth is, as many of them are struggling alone in private, as you saw in the video. And so what we wanna do is we wanna create an opportunity where everybody, this was one of our high goals. In fact, our board, this was one of our, our main priorities for our board is that everybody who came to mission, who showed up here for the first time or you showed up here for the 101st time, that you knew what your next step was to connect into our community, but not only to connect, but to take a step towards thriving life in Jesus. You knew what your next step was in terms of connection and in terms of spiritual growth. So this isn't built yet, but I want you to know what we're working on, what we've been planning on. We, we hired a, a fantastic leader. Some of you have met Ben Reed, a fantastic leader with, with uh, over a decade of experience in creating community uh, where people thrive. And this is his passion is creating thriving community. And what he's been working on is we've been learning from some, from some other churches. Uh, we've been adopting some, some uh, systems from other churches, but the reality is, is just shifting that here, is it gonna make it work? We've been trying to integrate that in. What does that look like in our church, in our community? 
community in, in, the, in this time. And what we're in the process of creating is what we're gonna call Thrive Track, where anybody can take a step towards thriving life in Jesus. And, and you can, you can uh, take steps over the course of a few weeks that launch you onto a path into a plan that helps you move towards thriving life in Jesus over, over time. Now, just a, a couple quick things. I, you're gonna have questions about this when I finish, and I don't have all the answers, because as I told you, it's not built yet. But I feel like we have a fantastic plan. Some of it is, is in the process of being built. Um, but this is what this is generally gonna look like. We're gonna create an environment that on any given week, anybody can show up at. You can show up after the service, you can, you, can, you can just come here, you can skip the service and go to it for that week, but it allows you to connect into a, an environment where you can discover what it is for you to take your next steps toward thriving life in Jesus. The first week of the Thrive Track is gonna focus on what is thriving life, defining how we, how we thrive in life. What does the scripture say about thriving life? How do people take steps towards that? Because here's one of the things we know. And some of you have seen this before. Every week, people show up, and they're in different stages of their spiritual growth. Some people, next slide, some people are exploring faith. Some people, some of you are here, and you're in the process of, you, you've decided, you know what, I wanna be a Jesus follower, and you're starting to build your faith. What do I believe about this? What do I believe the scripture says about relationships and about marriage and about finances? What does the scripture say about sexuality? And what's, what does the scripture uh, say about business and influence, and, and you're beginning to build a faith. What do I believe a, about the afterlife? What do I believe about the Holy Spirit and different things like that? There are people that are beginning to own their faith, and what that looks like is, I, I know now what I believe. Now I'm gonna try to begin to align my life to the things that I believe. And then finally, people that move to thriving in their faith and in their life. And nobody ever arrives at that place, but the goal is, is to move that place where we're thriving in ways and different areas in our life. I mean, it's not like you get here and you're done. But what happens is, is this creates a, a very clear path for us. These are the sort of stages that we can move from. There's, there's no hierarchy, not one's better than the other. We are all just at different stages taking steps. As we talked about last week, there's a, there's a very clear path in the scriptures. We unpacked this in Ephesians chapter three last week. There's some very clear steps to grow and thrive. And we talked about this last week. We want anybody, regardless of what, what stage they are in their spiritual journey, so whether you're exploring or you're building or you'd say I'm owning my faith or thriving my faith, for anybody who comes here, for everyone who comes here, we want them to be able to know what their next step is to know God more, to find greater freedom, to discover greater purpose, and then ultimately to make a difference in the lives of other people, to make it, for, for those, those truths to make a difference in their life, but also in the lives of other people. And those steps are vital to moving people towards thriving life in Jesus. That's how people move through the process towards thriving life in Jesus. The second week of the Thrive Track, we're gonna focus on how does that happen here through community here? We're in the process of not only uh, exploring, but building new group opportunities, uh, new opportunities for people to connect into our community. Again, whether they're exploring, specifically targeted towards people who are exploring, or people who are building their faith, what does it look like to build a, 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 a certain theological foundation for your life? What does it look like to begin to own your faith and, and take steps um, to align your, your life to what you believe? And then th for thriving, how do people uh, use their gifts and use um, what God's done in their life to impact other people? And we wanna, we, we're not only gonna create new opportunities for, to connect, but help people understand with what stage of, of their faith they're in, and specifically the way God grows our faith, the specific steps to spiritual growth, how you can connect. And we're gonna create lots of different groups, group opportunities, new group opportunities. Current group, our current group structure will fit perfectly within, inside of this. But within that, what does it look like to engage in ways um, where you can uh, continue to build your faith further. And so we want, we want to create new support groups and new Bible studies and new opportunities that purposefully within this study works with the way that God works, but also connects with people where they are in their specific stage of life. Week three will focus on helping people discover how they've been designed and gifted. You'll be able to understand your spiritual gifts and, and understand how God's wired you and how you can plug in and you can begin to discover your purpose not only making a difference uh, in our church, but in our community and even in the world, where people can take opportunities to, to take steps to connect and serve uh, here locally and abroad, where you can begin to understand God, how, how God's designed and wired you and how he wants to use you and make a difference in the lives of other people through you. And then lastly, uh, the fourth week, we're gonna focus on a first personal plan that when you're not here, because a big part of spiritual development is our, our us taking responsibility for our own faith. Let's be honest, if you don't take responsibility for your faith, I don't take responsibility for my faith, who will? 
And the reality is, is many of us need to take responsibility for our own faith. So what does that look like? How do we help people understand spiritual dis disciplines and what it looks like for them and equip them and give them tools so that they can begin to take steps towards thriving in their faith on their own? And, and this, again, as I told you, this is something that's not built, but it's something that you'll be able to engage in on any given week. It'll run the first four weeks of every month. And if there's a fifth Sunday, we'll take that Sunday off. You can jump in at any point, but anybody who's new, this will be the place, once we get to know them, once they stop by the hub, this will be the place people can take steps where they can discover, oh, here's where I am. I discovered I'm somebody who's exploring my faith. Here's what my next step is to connect here. Here's how God's created me. Here's how I can plug in and be a part of what's happening here. And then ultimately, here's a plan and a path. And the great news is, is it's gonna take some time, but we wanna, we wanna really equip a group of volunteers that can sort of be concierge, uh, can take a concierge approach in this. So that you, every week, you sit down with the same leader who's sort of facilitating the process. They're not gonna be your long-term leader, but they're facilitating the process that helps you understand what your next step to connection is and what your next step in spiritual growth is. And so this is gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take uh, some additional resources. It's gonna take more leaders. Um, you're gonna hear about more of that in, in the days ahead. But specifically to, towards creating irresistible community, we feel like this is gonna move us light years ahead. This is something we've never really had as a church. Not just recently, we've never really had as a church that really helps on a regular basis create a system where people can take steps to grow and thrive in their faith, but also a system of accountability that ensures that the leaders are helping people take a next step wherever they are uh, in their faith. Secondly, I want to talk to you about irresistible environments, but I'm not gonna, I wouldn't do that justice, and so I want to turn this over to somebody. About a year and a half ago, uh, we hired a fantastic leader. I, I would love to take credit that I brought him here, but I did not. God led this guy here. He has more um, passion and gifting in this area than just about anybody else I know, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Kenny this point, at this point. He's going to talk a little bit about irresistible Thank environments. You. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I mean, I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited about today, some of the things I wanna share with you. Um, you know, just uh, a year ago, I celebrated uh, 20 years in vocational ministry. I know I don't look that old, uh, but I've been at it for a while. About 20 years of vocational ministry, uh, and, and it's been amazing. And about two years ago, I was on a sabbatical. Uh, the church I was at gave me a couple months off, just a, a lot of ways to reflect on the, the previous years and then to, to really begin to look forward to what was coming next for me. And you know, when I look back at the, the previous years, uh, you know, 20 years vocational ministry, but on top of that, I had volunteered for 10 years when I was a teenager, and God called me into ministry when I was 14, so almost 25 years of investing toward the next generation. And a lot of the different experiences I've had at some of these different churches, um, amazing experiences, but almost every place I had been at, I always would hit a ceiling or a lid or a limit of, uh, because of what I believe God had put in my heart, a vision for the next generation, and it was never, uh, the, the church I was at, uh, the vision for the next generation for them wasn't as big as mine. And so when I was on my sabbatical, a lot of it was dreaming of, well, what does the next 10 years look like for me? What does the next 15 years look like for me? And, uh, and I had a lot of questions because, um, uh, because I really believe God was stirring my heart toward what was next. And I really believe the next season for me was gonna be my best. And I didn't know where that would be. And it was like six months after my sabbatical, uh, I had a phone call with Joel. And it was in that moment that I knew I was moving to Arizona. Uh, because uh, this was an opportunity to do some amazing things um, for the next generation. Uh, if you've spent any time with me, uh, you'll know that I'm very passionate about the next generation. I do have hobbies and other things, but like this is what really fuels me. And there's these two ideas, these two studies, these two stats that they keep me up at night, they, they drive me towards uh, what it is that I do. And I wanna share those with you because I think it'll provide some context of uh, what's next for us as a church in regard to the next generation. The first stat is this, this is very exciting to me. Uh, it, it says this, this is about a 10 year old study, but it says more than 80% of Christ followers made the decision to follow Jesus before the age of 14. If you were to walk down the street and you would identify a Christ follower, a Christian, uh, someone who follows Jesus, and you ask them when they did that, 80% of them would say that they did it before the age of 14. Like this is huge, this is huge. There's this window of opportunity. And if you have kids, you know this, that kids are curious, they're open, they're trying to figure out the world, they're trying to figure out who God is and what church is, how they fit into it. And, and kids, are, this is just a, a, a window where they're right. Uh, additional studies say that uh, typically what a child believes at age nine is what they'll believe the day that they die. So there's something very significant about this window. Another study commissioned by the same organization, no, no not this one here, another study uh, or by the same organization said that uh, just by living here in the United States, about 30%, kids have about a 30% ch chance of making a decision to follow Christ, where adults only have about a 6% chance. There's this window that we have that's significant 
that we can invest in the next generation. And living in a family-saturated community like we do here in Gilbert and Mesa and Chandler, the surrounding areas, we have an opportunity for the next generation. And I truly believe that maybe the greatest influence and the greatest impact that this church has in the East Valley is what we do for the next generation. There's this harvest, there's this opportunity here that we're gonna do that. Now there's this other study, this other statistic that, uh, that also drives me. Now, it's not necessarily as positive. This it kinda, you know, it can be concerning, but it says this, that 60% of believing kids abandon their faith within a year or two of graduating from high school, okay? These are my kids, these are your kids. As a, as a dad, like this concerns me. As a, as a next-gen pastor, this concerns me for your kids. That 60% of believing kids, kids that are growing up in the church, will choose to walk away from their faith within just a year or two of graduating from high school. Now, we've taken a lot of steps to try to mitigate this, and as long as I'm here leading in here, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that this statistic is not true of our kids, okay? We're, that's what we're focused on. It's one of the reasons why just a couple years ago, we initiated Lead Small Strategy, where we're putting adults and teenagers in the lives of every one of our kids, because uh, additional studies say that it takes about five intergenerational relationships investing in the life of a kid over a period of years to help kids have an authentic faith, one that lasts beyond high school and college. And so we've been working hard at that. We've seen a lot of great successes in that. In the last nine months alone, we've recruited a, uh, an additional 150 volunteers, most of them small group leaders, investing in your kids. Like, great things are happening. We continue to add to that, and we continue to grow in that area. Uh, just in the last couple of months, we've added brand new small groups and three-year-olds. And, and, and the next month, we're adding a bunch of new small groups for four-year-olds. Like, we are doing amazing things in this effort. And we have a lot of work ahead of us still. Uh, but we also have a problem. We have, we have an obstacle that's getting in our way, and that's our facilities. Our facilities are starting to get in the way of our strategy. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that if we just had the perfect buildings and everything would be okay and we'll, we'll reach kids for faith and raise them up. It's more complicated than that. But it is possible for facilities to get in the way of our strategy, and ours already are. Now, if you have kids, this may seem familiar and look familiar to you, but I wanna I want show you our current uh, layout of our facilities here, just to get, kind of have an idea of where we are, and there's some inherent uh, issues and challenges with those things. So if you look over here, we have our, our youth ministry over in our student center, which is right behind the hub, and it's actually, it's actually pretty good space. It's, it's, uh, it's this great environment where we do large group experiences, but the problem is that we're, we're already running out of space. If you go over there at 10.30, when our high schoolers meet, we're, we're getting to the place where we're starting to run out of space and it's, it's gonna limit our opportunity to grow. But the one thing that we don't have is we don't have any kind of relational space for our high school and junior high students. On Wednesday nights, we meet for tribes and we literally have high school students and junior high students all over the campus, but none of them in space that was ever designed for small group conversations. And here's the thing that we do know about high school and junior high students. They need spaces where they can sit down and they can talk about the things that maybe they're not talking with their moms and dads about. Like we need to create relational space where they can unpack what's happening in their life and how to process faith. And we don't have that space here. We have a, a great large group space, but no relational space. If we were to look over here in elementary, we, our elementary is actually divided by, between two different buildings. And so there's challenges. We're trying to bring these ministries together uh, philosophically and strategically, but it's just difficult because it's divided. We actually don't even have indoor plumbing in either one of these two buildings, so all our kids have to come over here to use a bathroom, which is a challenge because we'll be right in the middle of a small group space trying to talk with them and, and connect with them, and then they have to get up and leave. We have to take volunteers to take them to the bathroom. So this just creates challenges for us. And then our preschool space, we have a nursery building and a preschool building. And again, they're separated by two separate buildings, and it's hard for us to unify and uh, bring the strategy together. And, and one of our biggest challenges is our preschool building. It actually has 17 doors to the outside, okay? That gives me a heartache, you know, almost every night. Like, we spend a lot of time and effort because uh, safety and security is a high priority for us. We spend a ton of energy just making sure that these 17 doors stay locked and kids don't get out and other people don't get in. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually invest that energy in actually discipling and reaching kids instead of trying to protect that? So we got some, some challenges. And now here's a beautiful thing. We have plenty of space, 35,000 square feet of space to invest in the next generation. But maybe we're allocating our spaces incorrectly. And the reality is like this church has just grown and we've added to it. And so we have kids in spaces that were never, were never designed for kids. And mission has always had a plan for another phase where we would reallocate this space for the next generation. So here's some ideas, some things that about a year ago we started like dreaming about what we could actually do with this space and how we could invest in the next generation. So I wanna kind of share with you what we're looking at doing. 
Uh, so first of all, talking about moving our youth over to the family center. You know, the family center is actually an ideal space. It's massive, it's cavernous, it's huge. We can actually pack it out with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teenagers, and it's actually a better space for elementary. It's too big for elementary age kids. Our kindergartners walk in there, and they get overwhelmed by how big the space is, but it's actually perfect for youth. And right on the other side of our youth building is our offices, which we can actually tap right into that space and actually create amazing small group space designed for teenagers to be able to close a door and have conversations. And it's all connected in one place. So this is absolutely amazing. Then the idea would actually be moving our elementary to this building. We'd actually take over the entire building uh, because we need it. We could actually divide our large group space into two perfectly sized large group experiences that are just the right size for elementary age kids, but then dedicate the rest of the building to dedicated small group space to where our small group leaders can hear their kids and the kids can hear their small group leaders in space that was specifically designed for them. And we'd be able to reallocate the hub and, and seminar room and other spaces to other places around the campus. But uh, the last move that we would do is actually move our nursery and preschool to these two buildings. We have a breezeway between these two, but we could actually seal that off and create a secure environment with internal corridors and an amazing welcome, welcoming lobby where kids can come in, be dropped off, and have created a space that's perfect for preschoolers. And so if you look at this, it just makes sense. Like, it just makes sense that we would reallocate our space a little bit here. And I want to actually take a step further because we're really excited. We're working with an architect who's uh, helping us walk through these process. And just on Thursday, he sent us some new plans of what we're actually looking at. So this is actually the elementary space, this current student ministry center and, uh, and the hub and seminar room and community. And this is actually what it might look like for us to uh, reallocate the space to elementary spaces. So you look and see we have two uh, large group areas, one for K-third and one for four, five, six, uh, with, a, with a green room and dedicated uh, stage space and shared stage space, bathrooms in the same building, which is a huge win, and then actually small group space. Yep, yeah, we got some volunteers in here. Uh, and then actually small group space, dedicated small group space that was designed for kids to circle up and have conversations with their small group leaders. And so super exciting what this looks like. Here's actually a 3D rendering of the same space. And so doesn't, isn't this exciting? We begin to imagine like this is the type of environment that we could, we could, we could create for our elementary age kids. Now this is all I'm gonna show you today. Uh, we actually, uh, architects continue to work on some of our uh, other spaces. But I wanna show you some photos. This is actually from the architect. These are spaces that he created. But this is what it actually looked like as an elementary age kid walks in with a mom and dad and they see the space that was built for them, that engages their senses in a beautiful way. A lobby like this or, or a lobby like this, when kids walk in and, and they're just wowed by what we did. Uh, here's a picture of a large group space of, uh, of what it would look like uh, to gather kids to worship and to learn and to teach and to, to get their wiggles out. Uh, or even our small group space where, where actually kids can gather together in small group space and have conversations with their leaders and they can actually hear each other. So I just want you to imagine with me for a second of what we can do. I just showed you some elementary age space. But just imagine that we created lobbies and, and, and hallways that when a kid walks in, they know that this space was created for them. That even the walls and the environments are telling a story of God's grace and God's love before they even get to their classroom, before they even hear a teacher. That we create large group space where kids can connect with God in a powerful way, in a way that they were designed to hear and understand, and small group spaces that are inviting, that are secure, that are safe, where teenagers and kids can unpack what's happening in their life and faith in a way that's relatable to them. And that's the kind of impact that we could have in this community. When we create a space for our kids to grow, to connect with God, and to build a faith that lasts, a faith that lasts beyond high school, beyond college, and they could pass on to their own kids. And this is gonna impact our community in a, in a profound way. And Joel's gonna actually share in just a second about how, how this leaches out into our community and we can have a bigger impact in our community. So, Thank you so much. Uh, as one who has four kids that are uh, in these environments, I'm just thrilled, Kenny, that you're here and a part of this, uh, leading with us in this. And uh, one of the things Kenny didn't tell you is, is we've be a bunch of this work has already begun. Uh, uh, one of the extraordinary things, he doesn't like to brag on himself, over the last nine months, we've recruited 150 new volunteers uh, in our next-gen environments. Many of them, if not, I mean, the vast majority, if not almost all of them, small group leaders to connect them in the lives of students. And so uh, a lot of the work uh, for this, uh, the preparation work has already been done. Uh, it's just aligning uh, our, our facility to our strategy. The last thing I wanna talk about is um, irresistible impact. And this is probably the area where we have um, the, the least developed plans. I'm gonna talk about what we're, what we're targeting. Uh, the least developed plans, but the biggest dreams. 
And the reason that is, is because um, this is really about addressing some of the greatest needs in our community. Uh, the first week, I created a real problem for some of you. I'll revisit some of that in just a minute, but some real challenges that many of us, that go unseen in our community. We hear about how our community is thriving, but we don't realize that the, the unseen, difficult needs be below the surface uh, in our community. And um, we really wanna become a place that's really not only addressing those, but making a significant impact in our community. There's already schools, civic leaders, uh, nonprofit organizations that are calling, that are looking to us on a regular basis to help them with some of these difficult needs in our community. We already have some level of influence. We have, we're positioned for op an opportunity to really make a huge impact. And, and as you think about this, I want you to know our approach is gonna be twofold. We wanna take an intervention and a prevention approach. Some of what Kenny was just talking about is all preventative. It's keeping the next generation from falling into some of the same traps, from falling into some of the same things that, that many other people in our, our community are, are experiencing. Some of us have experienced in our lives. So there's, there's a lot of things that we're gonna do in terms of prevention um, beyond the next generation, but there's also things that we can do to partner in terms of intervention. And intervention is, is something that, that, um, that gets, it's easier to talk about, it's easier to go, hey, we're gonna partner with groups like Open Arms or House of Refuge or um, the foster care system. And, and they're sort of, it, it's, it's easy for us to point to those things. What doesn't get celebrated as often is all of the people that get rescued from the things that we're having to intervene in other people's lives of because it was prevented in their life because of what was poured into them on the front end. And so we wanna take an approach in both. Uh, the areas of focus uh, for us are, are obvious because this is connected to our community. First one is vulnerable children. And the, the ones that are, that are known, you know, there's, there's families in transition, there's the foster care crisis. I mean, those are some things that we feel like we need to double down on. We have opportunity. In fact, there's even new families. I've just, in the past few weeks, I've met two new families that have come to our church that are interested in, in fostering and, and adopting kids and, and being part of the solution in this. And this is such a big problem, and, and we saw such incredible momentum as we partnered uh, at the end of the last year in our Love Works uh, campaign, as we, as we connected with uh, the foster care system. Um, it was sort of just sparked a new fire, not just in our church, but by them going, hey, could we partner together more? There's so much work to be done here. And, and, and in addition to that, the, the vulnerable children in our community, the truth is, is um, uh, the, the drug uh, scene in our community ha is continuing to grow and it's continuing to uh, uh, impact our children, but not just drugs, uh, also technology. Um, one of the most interesting things that we don't think about often is um, much of what schools are reaching out to us for, parents are reaching out to us for, even uh, I just had a recent meeting with our mayor about this, some of our civic leaders going, hey, can, do you have any help? Do you have resources? Are you connecting anybody who can help us in this area? There's one thing that's really popping up that, that um, in this community, we, we just, it, it's sort of growing out of control and that's depression amongst our kids and our teenagers. And the experts will tell you much of it is connected to technology. Now, technology is not going away. And this isn't a, a speech against technology, but here's what you need to know, that we are placing devices in our kids' hands that elicit the same response, chemical response in their body, dopamine in their body, as does alcohol and drugs and gambling. And there's no age restrictions whatsoever. We're handing things to them that elicits a chemical response in their body that puts them in a position that, that, that the truth is, is it feels good. And when they get the like from their friends or the favorite from their friends or the follow from people, that elicits something in them that, that gives them a sort of a high. But when they get unfollowed or when somebody doesn't like or somebody posts negative, we're seeing dramatic results in our kids and our teens like we've never seen before. And somebody's gotta do something. Somebody, people are looking to us for help and for education. We're connected to experts that can help speak into this and we need to. And it represents an incredible opportunity in our community. The second one is marriage health. We, we, this, is, this is a huge deal for a number of reasons, but we really, uh, we've adopted some new tools to do some preventative work, but also some ongoing maintenance for people in their marriages. We wanna bring back some events that we used to, we used to do, but for, in a season we weren't able to afford. Things like uh, Date Night Phoenix and, and create some marriage intensives that are not just a, a Bible study, but opportunities for, for couples who are sort of in crisis to get the real help uh, that they need. And here's why this is so important. Did you know that, that um, the, the uh, I'm losing... Uh, I'm gonna post this online because I can't remember the name of the organization. There's a, there's a marriage uh, organization, Christian marriage organization, um, that did a study and discovered that uh, kids that come from divorced families are twice as likely to walk away from their faith as kids that come from uh, homes where uh, their parents stay together. Twice as likely. As the marriage rate in our area increases, it literally is eroding the next generation of Christians. This is a huge, this is a faith issue. 
This isn't just a, are we committed to marriage or not? This is a, this is a, a faith issue for us in terms of, of reaching the next generation and leading them towards faith in Jesus. And then last week, lastly, um, I have some personal huge dreams in the area of leadership influence. Uh, we are connected with a national organization uh, that wants to partner with us to do some things that will invest in our leaders uh, in our church to help them thrive in their areas of leadership outside the church, to help them gain more influence so that they can influence people in their, their circles of influence. But not only that, that will help us to gain influence with influential leaders to help uh, reach them for kingdom impact. And so I'm really excited. There's some, some incredible opportunities for us to make a difference in our community uh, by gaining influence uh, with leaders, by building up leaders here. Now, this, this 2020 Vision Initiative, this is sort of a sprint over the next couple of years. And it represents us taking some quantum steps. And I don't know about you, but this is all like terribly exciting stuff. And it's big and it's bold. It's audacious. I, I admit that. The truth is, it's gonna require all of us. We talked about this last week. I think a step like this, a huge faith step, is gonna require not just a faith step by me or by our staff or by our board. It's gonna require a faith step by all of us to, to accomplish this because we're gonna need people resources and we're gonna need financial resources. As a matter of fact, the total cost of execution for this is about an additional four and a half million dollars for us over the next two years. Now that, personally, when you think about your personal budget, that looks like a massive number. But the size of church we are, and again, we've been working with some, some experts um, that, that do this. The truth is, 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 this is within our reach. It is a stretch. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be a challenge for us. But this is well within our reach in order for us to accomplish this over the next few years. Now, I want, I want you to know, because some of you go, well, what does that go to? That's a big number. I wanna show you exactly the breakdown of the cost. Much of it, as you, as you can see, goes to the next generation uh, campus uh, upgrade budget. Now, some of that will not just affect the next generation. It'll affect a creating environment for growth track and some of the other tr leadership training stuff that we're gonna do and our 55 plus group and, and, and some other things. There, there's gonna be some upgrades in that way that will uh, allow us to... Uh, do what we're doing at a much uh, uh, higher uh, level. The second thing is we have some deferred maintenance that in a season where we didn't have as many resources, we deferred some maintenance that, that is to keep upkeep in terms of, of, um, of having irresistible environments. Many of those things are air conditioning units, <laughs> I'll just say. So we all love air conditioning here in Arizona. So that, that's a part of this project, local impact projects, um, our staff and contract work uh, over two years, so over the next two years, and then uh, startup and training. Uh, that we need to, to accomplish these things. The, the budget of this and, and the detail of this is all gonna be on our website. But some of you wonder, okay, okay, is that possible in terms of our budget? Well, our annual uh, standard operating budget is about $4 million. If you follow this, uh, some of you know this will be a review. Some of this is brand new. But our, what it costs us to do ministry, as, you know, just as usual right now, is about $4 million. And we could just keep going on doing that. Um, I know some of you follow uh, our finances more closely than others. And some of you go, hey, I, I've gotten your emails and I try to respond to all my emails. Um, I, I'm a little slow sometimes, I'll, I have to admit. But um, some of you said, hey, we're not quite meeting the numbers. Like, especially recently, we're, we're short on some of those numbers. Well, I'll tell you one of the two, two important things you need to know. One, uh, we operate on a $4 million budget in terms of our, our expense budget. And then what our, our uh, projected giving this year was about 4.4 million. It was, it's, it's beyond what we're taking in. So that's, what we, that's just what we projected, which is sort of an educated guess based on uh, previous years. But we're at a rate of about $4.1 million. As we end our fiscal year, we should, we should finish at about $4.1 million. So we're, gonna, we're covering our expenses fine. But the reality is, is, is um, for many of us, uh, we, don't, we, we wonder, how are we going to get to that extra $4.5 million? I'll just say, uh, before I leave this, all of this information is going to be on our website at uh, Go to, go to the website, I forgot what it was, thriveatmission.org. Thriveatmission.org is where all this information is. But here's the question I get from people. I wanna close with this. The question I get from people all the time is, hey, this is amazing. Like, this is bold. Like, this is stuff that, that we, we've never had. We've never, you know, really had a system that really led everybody towards thriving life that, that helped people take spiritual next steps. We never really had that ever as a church, not just in recent years, but ever. We, we, we really want to have irresistible uh, environments for the next generation. That's going to help us reach our neighbors, and, and, and we want our kids to continue in faith. We want to make it home. We care about our community. We care about what the direction it's headed. The question I get from people all the time is, this is incredible, but can we do this? Like, can we, can we actually make this happen? Like, do we have the capacity to do this? And I'm gonna be honest with you in the same answer. Some of you who've asked me this question, you know I've said this. When people ask me that question, the first, my first answer, my most honest, honest answer is, I don't know. I don't know if we're ready for this. I don't know uh, 
where, where all the resources will come from, how it'll all work, and, and, and I feel like we, we've got a good plan, I feel like we're working with good people that are helping us put together a plan, execute a plan, but the truth is, is I don't really know, like I'm not a fortune teller, I don't, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future, I don't know if we can do this or not, but I believe we have to. I believe we must do this, and I believe this is why we're here, and I'm not the only one. There's a whole bunch of people as I've started meeting in smaller groups with people that, that as, as we've started, started to talk about this, there's people that have decided to make some really large commitments towards helping us accomplish this. Our, our elders, our board are all in on this. Our staff is all in on this. And the truth is, is we, I, I think this is something that we have to do. This is what God's positioned us here to uniquely do to have an impact in this community. I believe he's placed us here at this time he, I believe he's called you, he has purpose for you in this, and here's why. We're in one of the most thriving places in the nation, statistically, and yet at the same time, on the rise is drug abuse in our community. I told you this a few weeks ago. The, 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 the number of, of arrests, in uh, heroin arrests in our community alone, just in, in the city of Gilbert, has tripled in the last 10 years. The, the rate of of uh, deaths in our community related to heroin has doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, opioid usage and, and arrests and, and, and overdose has increased by 75%. 490 plus million pills prescribed last year. Seven, that's 75 pills per person in our state. This last year, it's a huge issue. And this is affecting all sorts of, of our communities. Somebody came up after the last service, told me a story about the, how this impacted uh, their neighborhood in, in, in just an unbelievable way. This is hidden in plain sight in our community. On the rise is depression, not just amongst adults, but amongst our teenagers. We rank, and we rank eighth in the nation um, in, um, in, in terms of, of uh, the depression and suicide rate. The truth is, is we rank second amongst teenagers and children. Second in the nation. This is a huge problem. Divorce is growing. In the last five years, just five years ago, we were 29th in the nation. Now we're 13th. Just, just in five years uh, in the state of Arizona. This is not in some faraway land. This is here. This is something that is touching us. It's impacting us. This is impacting our community. This is impacting our children. This is impacting your neighbors, your friends. Some of you, you'd say, this is impacting you. This is all too close to home. And if it hasn't touched you yet, if it hasn't impacted your family, the odds are you're just a little ways away. You may be a month away or a year away. You may just be one generation away. I don't think this is something we should be asking if we can do this or not. I think this is something we have to do. But still, the question remains, can we do this? Like, can we make it happen? I don't know, but let me ask you this. If we don't, who will? Come on. If we don't do something about this, if the church doesn't rise up and be the solution to some of these challenges in our community, who's gonna do it? If we don't position where we are with the gifting that we have, with the resources that we have, if we don't decide to leverage and this next season give a hard focus to addressing some of the major challenges and creating environments where people can move towards the only way you can thrive in life, and that is in a relationship with Jesus, who will do that? This is an extraordinary problem, but I, I'd rather, rather see it as a problem. I think it's an extraordinary opportunity. This is a massive opportunity. What we do next will determine what our legacy is. What we do next will determine the story that's told about our impact in this community. And I don't think we should wait. I think if we wait, the only thing that'll happen is it'll get more difficult. It'll get more challenging. Things will continue to go the way they go. The truth is, is we're large enough. We have enough influence. We can literally make a difference in our community, not just a temporal difference, but an eternal difference in the lives of people. So can we do this? I don't know if we can do this, but I think we have to. And I think we have to try. I don't think we can do this individually. I don't think any of us can do this on our own. But I think we have to try. And here's what I know. I know it's gonna stretch us. It's gonna stretch our staff. It's gonna stretch uh, our volunteer base. It's gonna stretch many of you. But this massive opportunity is what we need to stretch us because here's what will happen. As God stretches us, you know what'll happen? We'll grow. 
I want you to think about the last opportunity, the last time in your life when you were really stretched. Maybe it was in your career. Maybe it was in your marriage. It was probably with your kids. You were stretched in some way. And what happened when you made it through, when you got to the other side of that, when you were stretched, what happened? You grew. See, I think this has as much potential to impact us internally as it does represent an opportunity for us to impact our community externally. I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for us in this season to take a step, a huge faith step. So this is what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to take a faith step. And, and today, as you leave today, you're gonna get a card. And the thing is, is, is on that card, there's a bunch of information, some that represents today. But if, if the card is inviting you to take a faith step with us to help us accomplish this over the next two years. And the truth is, is you're gonna see a, a, a series of steps on that card. And this series of steps represent how many of us are engaged in different ways in our church. And what I want you to do is, I just want you to take the card. I'm not asking you to make any commitments today. I'm asking you to consider a faith step a personal faith step that some of you, you give occasionally and, and you appreciate your church and you give, you may, he may be even new to faith or new to giving and you give occasionally. I want you to consider being an intentional giver where or some of you are at. You, you've chosen, I'm gonna give, we're gonna give a certain amount on a regular basis. Others of you are priority givers where you said, hey, there's a certain percentage that comes off the top on a regular basis. We give this percentage of what our income is to God. We believe that's a biblical principle. Some of you are going, I understand tithing in the scriptures. That, that we ought to tithe, we ought to give 10%. And, and some of you have chosen to give at that level. And some of you give above and beyond that when we do things like this. Wherever you are, what all I'm gonna ask is that you would take a step. Now, here's something you need to know about me. Clearly, I am not a fundraiser. Like, that's not what I do. I have no interest in raising funds. Like, that's not, it's not my passion. That's not my priority in this. In fact, next week, we're gonna go back to the personal side. What I'm passionate about is I wanna get back into Ephesians 5. I want you to understand how this project and how what God's doing through this church impacts you personally and how you can personally engage to finding thriving life in Jesus. That's, so that's what we're gonna do next week. But then in two weeks, I'm gonna ask you to pray through and potentially for you to make a, a commitment in two weeks about a faith step you would take. And here's why this is a priority for me. It's not because I, I, we need the four and a half million dollars to accomplish these, these, these initiatives. We do. We do. Ch candidly, we do in, tor tor in order to accomplish all that. But I feel like God's gonna do all of that. Here's the thing. The reason I care about this is because I think it represents a massive opportunity for you to grow and for me to grow. My wife and I are gonna make our largest commitment to date to this initiative. And it's because we know God will stretch us and he will grow us in this. So here's what I wanna ask you. I wanna ask you to take a faith step. As a pastor, my passion is not re raising four and a half million dollars. My passion is 100% participation. I'm gonna ask every single one of you to consider taking a faith step because here's what I know. You will get as much out of this as you give to it. You'll get more out of it in many cases than you give to it because I think as God stretches you, He's gonna grow you. And that is gonna represent a huge step for you and for us as a community to find thriving life in Jesus. So here's the thing. I want you to know I'm praying for you. As you consider taking a faith step to join God in what he's up to through our church here at Mission. And I wanna ask you to do something bold. If you will commit, as you get this card and you walk out today, if you'll commit to praying to how God, the faith step that God wants you to take in participation with us in helping us accomplish this and helping us make an impact in our community, would you do something really, really bold? If you're just committed, if you commit today to praying, would you just stand if you're willing to pray uh, about how God would have you take a faith step just right now? You know, if, if you're somebody who's new or you don't feel like this is for you, that's okay. But if you're willing to just pray about it, as you get a card on your way out today, if you're willing to just pray and ask God, God, do you want me to take a faith step? Would you have me take a faith step? And what is my next faith step to be a part of this? Would you just stand? Look at that. So extraordinary. Let's pray. God, I pray um, today um, that this would be a memory in our minds. I pray that because um, this represents our faith intention to follow you in whatever way you lead us personally. God, I pray as a part of this invitation today, nobody feels guilt, nobody feels pressure, but that what people hear, what people experience, what people feel is an opportunity to step into something, to take a, a big step, a stretching step, a faith step in you, to 
then rely on your faithfulness to make up the gap. God, I believe this re represents a huge obedience faith step for us at church. And I pray that you would work in the hearts and lives of people who are standing today going, God, I wanna follow you and be obedient to you in the faith step that you would have me take. I pray that you'd speak to them personally, individually. You'd speak to them with clarity and they would know exactly what the next right step is for them to take this step towards you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.